does everybody um, understand the reference to, to the fabrications and the instructions? I would like you to clear that up. I... The um, it's it's a it could be a, con a potentially confusing word, and I went back and forth. Um, the reason why I ended up using fabrications as opposed to maybe reactions um, is that that's the word that directly that's directly relates to dependent origination and the Anapanasati Sutta and the Satipatthana Sutta. In other words, it references fabrications. So fabrications are in in the in the framework of the Dhamma, in the context of the Dhamma, are assumptions we've made about ourselves in relation to the world that are rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths. They're fabricated. They're, they're something that's put together from that ori original ignorance. So to call it something else, I think would ultimately be more confusing, but I also understand just the confusion of that, of just using the word. So a bodily fabrication is an, a sensation in the body that's arising from a conditioned way of thinking rooted in ignorance in the world. So it's either, it could be something that we're simply holding in our body, stress mm -hmm. you know, and the results of stress that comes up simply because we're quieting our minds and our bodies is still acting, acting out. Or it could be something that comes up during meditation. We have a, a, a thought of something that is bothersome and we react to that. So a, a bodily fabrication, the simplest and really the most useful way to look at it is a feeling or a reaction that we're holding in our body. A mental fabrication can be just an agitated mind state, or it could be something that's feeding those bodily fabrications. But mm -hmm. the, the whole point is that they're fabricated. They're, they're assumptions we make about ourselves in relation to the world rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths. Mm -hmm. And so in the, in the depend, dependent origination says that from ignorance comes the first step, the first condition from ignorance comes fabrications, comes mental fabrications. And then from that, the next 11 links in the chain end up in suffering. So calming bodily fabrications and calming mental fabrications directly addresses that initial problem of ignorance. It's a, it's a visceral experience of the results of ignorance. Mm -hmm. And in the Satipatthana Sutta, there's a, there's a reference to calming bodily fabrications. And in the Anapanasati Sutta, where the Buddha is using the, uh, the example of about a dozen um, monks who have well-developed the Dhamma as what, they do, what they're doing in meditation. So they're breathing in. And as they're breathing in, because they understand the entire framework of the Eightfold Path and they understand how to meditate, as they breathe in, bodily fabrications calm. As they breathe out, bodily fabrications calm. In other words, it's not, I'm not breathing in and I'm going to calm my bodily fabrications. Right. That's just yeah. another distraction. Mm -hmm. It's as a result of a proper meditation practice within the framework of the Eightfold Path that while we meditate, it's a natural occurrence. I breathe in because of my mind is now becoming more concentrated. Bodily fabrications are calming. The same thing with breathing out. Being mindful of the in-breath and the out-breath completes that cycle <clears throat> of as Jen said, of, of taking wisdom in this pro into its proper place, into what's occurring right now. And as we are present and well concentrated, mental and bodily fabrications simply fall away. So in meditation, it's taken me a while. I've been wanting to introduce that instruction in meditation, but as a Sangha, we really didn't have the reference for it yet. And, and, and now I hope we do. Mm -hmm. um, and again, my concern is that it doesn't become a distraction during meditation, mm -hmm. that it's understood. So what would you say about that? I, I would, first of all, your explanation was really helpful for me because it was becoming a distraction for me because I wasn't sure. I had a, after you explained, <clears throat> I, I did have, I was on the right path. I was on the right track for, for um, understanding the word and understanding its use during meditation. But I was not quite there. Yeah. And, and the, the, the idea that these fabrications just fall away 
because you now you're concentrated, your mind is concentrated and your mind is in your body. Yeah. That that really helps me. That will really help me. Because in the in the past, when I'm thinking of fabrications, I start I get distracted by that word. I'm thinking, mm-hmm. why is it fabrication? Am I fabricating now? Yeah. I, you know, I'm just like it's, it's unfamiliar. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. So thank you. That, that thank you. Really I <clears throat> I think just now when you explained it, what I was hearing was that the direction is actually, and this is too many words to be able to say for it to work in meditation, but just to like give the long winded, my interpretation of what the direction is, is breathe in and notice fabrications. I wouldn't even say it's that. Like, I would. Calming. It's more of an. It's more I've of a description of doing of, that, like cal- like to calm them down. You know what I mean, like. Yeah, that's the caution. That's just incorrect. Incorrect. Yeah, it's really an an a description of what what should be occurring during meditation. In other words, as you're breathing in, bodily fabrications are calming. Mm-hmm. As you're breathing out, just both fabrications. They're they're calming as a consequence of a correct meditation practice. In other words, we're not doing it directly. Right. And that's the, even in, in a lot of the, uh, a lot of the texts, it's, it's presented that way that we breathe in and we're intentionally while we're breathing in, we're calming bodily fabrications. And that's a wrong application because yes. we have to understand how, why, why and how the Buddha taught meditation. He didn't teach meditation itself for doing anything other than deepening concentration. And so as a result of deepening concentration within the proper framework, you know, we, we had a brief discussion mm-hmm. about that. It's not just meditation. Meditation supports developing the, the rest of the Eightfold Path. And it's through that well-integrated path that all of these things occur as a natural expression of it. And really, ultimately, they occur as a natural expression of changing the way we think. An ego, self-referential ego self, wants to always be engaged in doing something. Mm-hmm. And when we've decided that, in a very broad sense, I'll say this, that we're a broken or flawed self, that we need to fix something, everything that follows will be taken that way, that we need to fix something. So while the instruction is to calm bodily fabrications, it must be wrong to have them. I got to I gotta fight with them. I got to struggle. I got to subdue them. It's simply a natural expression of a, a well-focused Dhamma practice and a correct meditation practice. But it's important, the reason why the instructions are there, it's important to hold that in mind as to what's occurring during meditation so that we remember, we know, we know this, is what I'm, this is why I'm doing this, and to recognize the effect both on our cushions and off our cushions. Because you, you emailed me a week yeah, or so ago I about did. that. Yes. Does your understanding help? <laughs> is Absolutely. It, yes. Uh, I was sort of been, been back in back about you know, when you change the tape on the website, which I use when I'm meditating, um, I was like, you, what, wasn't that publication? <laughs> you know, so I emailed him and, uh, you know, I asked him. So I've heard your description of what is a mental fabrication, what is a bodily fabrication. And just it's just to note that as you meditate, this is occurring. Really. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I've heard your description of that, which you've just kind of done today as well. So I'm kind of calm and at peace with it now. But when you first changed it, I wasn't really sure what. Yeah. To, you know, it, it became became a distra- mm-hmm. distraction in your meditation. Trying yeah, to no, I didn't know what it was. You know, yeah. So not anymore. Good. Good. Well, thanks for the email and the feedback. I did put a written description of this right at the beginning of the instructions on the website. But I think what I'll, I'm going to edit this out and put it on there too, because it is confusing, but it's also so important you know, to understand yeah. this is really what we're doing. Yeah. You know, another word for fabrications is simply an ongoing distracting reaction in our body. Another word would be stress, mm-hmm. which is ultimately where we're going with this, the elimination of our own contributions to stress. And there's nothing more that we need to do than to simply develop an eightfold path. 
anything else then becomes a distraction, even trying to figure out where they come from and all that. So thank you for the feedback and where that, that helps. Um, yeah, this was helpful in other, other ways for me too, because when I first, I'm just getting, I'm just getting past the way I used to think about meditation when, when I first started was that I have to, I have to, I have to get to a certain point in this meditation. It was like, you know, if I don't have, if I don't feel this, this sort of release yep. when I'm meditating, then, you know, I'm just going to keep going until I feel that. <laughs> so that was like becoming a, you know, yeah. it was a distraction. And that's now I'm learning that that's not the point. The point is to do exactly what you said. Breathe in and breathe out and concentrate on your breath and and just let things sort of fall away. Yep. That that's as a... as they do. Yeah. Yeah, as they do. That's as right. As they do. As a consequence of yeah. a, of a correct meditation practice within the framework of the Eightfold Path, they naturally do. Mm -hmm. The Buddha never in any of the sutras I've ever read, he never said he never he never set out any any goals other than deepening concentration. In fact, there's never there's never even any reference to if you do this for eight minutes, you're going to feel wonderful or you'll feel right. blissful. There, there's what he does describe within the framework. Again, this is why it's so under, important to understand the context. He describes the quality of mind of an awakened human being, meaning someone who has rightly self awakened through the eightfold path not just meditation, as calm and at peace. So, and again, that's not the goal. It's the result of a well-integrated Dhamma practice. That's that's how the Buddha presents it. And I hope I do the same mm -hmm. thing. But our minds, again, because we, we, we're lacking right view, we think there's something wrong with us or lacking in us. There's something we need to acquire or achieve that we're always, look, we need a goal to go towards. It really relates to the suit if I ever get to it today. And that and that goal is usually um, relief from our own minds. And so in that way, it's the same as taking a good stiff drink, isn't it? Yes. it, it meaning meditation. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Buddha didn't teach escape from who we are and what we are. He taught us to, to realize an authentic self. And that again, that relates to the to the sutta today. So any meditation practice that is that is geared towards anything other than deepening concentration is, and I'm careful when I say this, is not what a Buddha taught. It may bring other benefits. There's, you know, there's, there's benefits to any type of meditation practice in developing relaxation. Uh, using a body scan or an, even in, in uh, yoga nidra is a good example of that. But any, you know, there's more um, modern versions of body scanning. If you if you do yoga need if I we did that right now, we would feel most of us would feel wonderful. We'd be very relaxed, and there's nothing wrong with that. But it does nothing to deepen concentration. It's simply a different focus. We're using a so-called meditation technique to make ourselves feel better. Great, that's wonderful. It's much better to do that than to take a good stiff drink or smoke a joint or anything else. It's simply not part of a Dhamma practice. And that's the, that's the important distinction. So just whilst talking sure. about meditation, um, is the, is the point of doing a longer meditation or when you feel reluctant, that you can't do a longer meditation. Is it the fact that you're just looking at that window in your life when you're just not going to have any referential views and it's scary to you, you know, just that you, you're trying to disassociate with your ego. If you meditate for 20 minutes and you look at a 45 minute meditation, you think, oh my goodness, you know. It, it, it's just that you you just don't feel comfortable at looking at 45 minutes of, med of your life without your ego or without your ego focusing on things to feed back. Is that just what a longer meditation is as opposed to a shorter meditation? I got to ask you a question. Did you read this sutta? Which the sutta? Sutta? The Sariputta Sutta? The one that, yeah. No. Because that's exactly what, that's the same question that Ananda asked Sariputta, the basis <laughs> for this. Um, so I'm going to answer it twice. I'm going to answer it. I'm going to read that. 
the I think what you're describing is almost almost like a fear of the unknown. Like I understand 20 minute meditation and it seems to really work, and, but could a longer meditation, maybe I can't handle that. Yeah. Because you don't know what to expect. Yeah. And so this is another reason why it's so important to have a proper meditation practice within the broader framework because it, it avoids creating more delusion and more ignorant views within our own mind. And the reason why I say that is I've been meditating for 30, I don't know how many years, well over 30 years. And I've been teaching for eight years. And I know many, many people that were doing just a, a meditation practice that increased their own conditioned thinking because they had no frame of reference for realizing that. The Buddha saw that too. That's the main reason why he taught an eightfold path. So we could recognize our views rooted in ignorance and not increase them by by wrong meditation. He taught the eighth factor of the Eightfold Path is right meditation, which implies that there's such a thing as wrong meditation. So within this framework, and I and I would say the way that I teach it, and I think I teach the way the Buddha teaches it, to gradually increase your time, you avoid anything that could reinforce conditioned thinking. But it's also an understanding. Again, Ananda asked basically the same question 2,600 years ago. So there's no... There's nothing to fear about a longer meditation session as long as you, you're ready for it. Yeah. So like you learned meditation, when you first started a few years ago, two or three minutes was a long time, wasn't yeah. it? And now you're up to 20 minutes and I understand probably 30 minutes. Especially it, it's not that, it, and that took you a reasonable amount of time to build up to that. Rather than having a teacher say, in order for you to meditate successfully, it has to be 30 minutes or it has to be an hour, which is often how even in many of the established schools, they, they start at 45 minutes and they present it like this is the only way you can meditate. And it's just too difficult for so many, for many, many people. And even those that are able to do it, it often just reinforces their conditioned thinking because there's no other framework. There's nothing else presented. I, again, I've read... I, I think I've read just about every instruction the Buddha ever gave for meditation. I've never, ever come across one meditation, one instruction that said, meditate for this long. It was always consistently. He started out very, find the root of a tree or an empty, an empty hut, meaning go find a quiet place away from the world. And then he gave simple instructions to be mindful of the breath in the body, be mindful of feelings or bodily fabrications arising and passing away, be mindful of thoughts arising and passing away, and finally be mindful of the present quality of your mind, no matter what, meaning you're, it, and that fourth foundation of mindfulness is often misunderstood, that it, that that fourth foundation of mindfulness must be a calm and peaceful mind. The Buddha, if you understand the teachings, the Buddha said, just be at peace with whatever quality of mind you have, because you understand impermanence. No matter what's going on, what, no matter what quality of mind I have, it's impermanent. So I don't need to react to it. If I feel unhappy or sad or agitated, etc. And my mind is well concentrated and mindful of what's occurring. That feeling is probably appropriate for what's occurring. It doesn't need to be any different. In fact, it can't be. So again, getting back to that question, it really is just fear of the unknown. And 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 the last tenacious threads mm -hmm. of a self-referential mm -hmm. ego self saying, "Don't go there," yeah. <laughs> because you're really going to be lost. And that's again, that's a nondis question. So let's get to it. <laughs> And this is this is a rather rather short sutta, um, but it's so interesting. And it, so, Sariputta. Very quickly, remember the a couple of weeks ago we got into the Sariputta and the Moggallana and how they were the, the Buddha's two chief disciples. They both came to the Buddha eventually after quite a few years of studying, much like the Buddha did in the same environment. And within a week of hearing the Buddha's brief instructions, they both awakened. And so once they both awakened, the Buddha had them establish as now you now you're going to help me teach. And they did immediately. So there's two things that are important to take out of that is the importance of listening to and using as a resource someone who understands the Dhamma. But the implication is also there that to be cautious of of not following someone who doesn't understand the Dhamma, because if you can't teach something you don't know, it's just. That, that's the point. So Sariputta knows the Dhamma. Ananda, who was the Buddha's cousin and his chief attendant for most of the Buddha's life, including about every sutta, every teaching the Buddha ever gave for the last 25 years, 
is still confused about this fundamental aspect. And he sees it, and the question comes up often is, well, if I let go of all self-referential views, what happens to me? That feels like annihilation. What's going to become of me? This is really the same question that you kind of answered, asked. What if I go deeper in my meditation? What happens to me? Ananda is asking that same question. If I, if, I understand, if I develop the Dhamma to such a point where there's no self-referential views, how am I going to relate to the world? What's my point of reference at that point? Again, it's that same question about annihilation. What Ananda doesn't quite get yet, and you can't really understand it until you become rightly self-awakened, but you can understand the path getting there, is that the Buddha never taught that upon awakening, the self vanishes. He never taught that. He never taught annihilation. In fact, that's an extreme view that the Buddha would say just that. That's an extreme view. The Buddha simply taught that the, the views you're holding to establish and define a self are wrong views. They don't accurately describe a self. Let go of the views. What is the end result of letting go of all those views? It's an ongoing expression of life as life occurs without the need for it to be any different. So the question is, well, what's experiencing that What's experiencing life? And you can say, well, a self is, but it's an awakened self. The Buddha certainly, the Buddha awakened, lived 45 more years, the most important and successful life ever lived as an awakened self. He, he always referred to himself. He didn't say, I am a rightly self-awakened. He said, I'm the rightly self-awakened one. He didn't say, I'm a rightly no self-awakened one. Doesn't even make sense. Mm -hmm. Here's an awakened human being sitting in front of you. There, That's a self. But it's not itself rooted in wrong views. And so Ananda had that same question. And it's it's a fundamental question. You think about how Ananda is in the Dhamma. He's listening to the Buddhist teachings every day. He's doing the practice. And yet he still has that gnawing shred of, of self-reference that he, he has a hard time letting go because he doesn't understand. It's the, it's the fear of the unknown. What's going to happen to me when I let go of all the views? And Sariputta's answers are, are just wonderful. So there's the introduction. <laughs> On one occasion, Venerable Ananda visited the Venerable Sariputta. They exchanged courteous greetings, and Ananda took a seat next to his friend. Ananda asked a question. Dear friend, could one develop concentration to the point that they would not be sensitive to the, per to the, uh, the usually the, the, the word in the sutta was to the, that they would not be perceptive to the earth. So it, it, an easier word to understand is just sensitive. So that they would not be sensitive to the earth or the elements of the earth, meaning you, you lose your reference. Could one develop concentration to the point that they would not be sensitive to the infinitude of space or of consciousness? Those were common questions at the time of if you, the, 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 almost as a, a spiritual practice the goal is to understand the infinitude of space. And then remember the teachings, mm -hmm. the Buddha said, those are just, just disregard those. Those are, yeah. those are distractions to the goal. Could one develop concentration to the point that doubt that they would not be sensitive to nothingness or of neither perception nor non-perception. Again, those common teachings of the time still around today, rooted in the Vedas. Could one develop concentration to the point that they would not be sensitive to this world or the next world? Would this one still be sensitive to what is occurring. So all those questions that Ananda is asking now, he's heard from the Buddha and other people around them that those questions themselves are rooted in ignorance. Let go of the questions and let go of the, the need to understand the infinitude of space or the, this world or the next world. Remember the, the question what, that was often put um, from Vachagoda, Anaruda, et cetera, Malakya Puta, basically what happens to me? Where did I come from and where am I going? What about my past lives? What about my future life? That's a question. It says, how do I establish myself in the past so that I can continue to establish myself in the future? Mm -hmm. Look at where your mind is. It's nowhere near what's occurring. So the Buddha said, let go of those views. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't say that there's no such experience, but objectifying yourself to the past or the future, you're missing out here. Your mind is not united in your body. Let go of the questions. He repeatedly said to Vachagoda and others, it's your questions that's confusing you. Let go of the question. Oftentimes he would, he would just sit silently 
to not feed that ignorance that is causing that question. A self-referential ego self insists on an answer to every question that it could come up with. Why? Because it's establishing itself in those questions or it wouldn't have the question in the first place. And this gets into that, I won't get too deep into it, but it gets into that whole overemphasis that's put on past lives. The Buddha never said there's no such thing as past lives. He just said they're completely unimportant as far as the Dhamma is concerned. They're just a distraction. So that's where, so those are Ananda's, that's the basis for Ananda's questions. He, understand that these are, he understands that these are foolish questions and concepts, but what happens when I let go of all of them? Saraputta answers, yes, dear friend, dear friend Ananda, even with great concentration, this one could be sensitive to what is occurring, the whole point of the Dhamma. The whole essence of the Buddha's mindfulness is to be mindful of life as life occurs within the right frame of reference, right view. Ananda says to Saraputta, please explain how one could develop concentration so that they would not be sensitive to the earth or to this world or the next world and still be sensitive to what is occurring. A simple way of saying, of asking that question is, please explain how I can be sensitive when I let go of all my views. Can you read his question again? Sure. It's, it, it really is the fundamental question that we're all asking, isn't it? Or that we might be asking as resistance to what we're learning. Ananda asked, please explain how one could develop concentration so that they would not be sensitive to earth or to this world or the next world. And, and, and reference to the earth is really reference to the exterior world, what's occurring. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, it's not so much the yeah, it's not so much the, the physical universe. It's 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 my clinging to the worldly yeah. events. Let me go back. Please explain how one could develop concentration so that they would not be sensitive to worldly events or to this world or the next world, and still be sensitive to what is occurring. Again, you can't understand how you could lose the self reference and still be sensitive to the world. Saraputta says, "Let me explain." On one occasion, I was here in Savati at the blind man's grove. I developed concentration to the point that I was neither sensitive to, to the, the worldly events or to this world or the next world. And yet I continued to be sensitive to what is occurring. He's describing his awakening process, which happened really within a week of meeting the Buddha. Please tell me, dear friend Saraputta, what were you sensitive to at that time? What a great question. Hmm. If you're no longer referencing the world around you, what are you referencing? What are you sensitive to? The answer gets right to the heart of the matter. Saraputta has now withdrawn his, uh, his self-referential, outwardly focused, objective views. And he's now, as the Buddha described, he's rightly self-awakened and his focus is right within Ananda, I was sensitive to the cessation of becoming further ignorant of Four Noble Truths. I was sensitive to unbinding from views ignorant of Four Noble Truths. He's describing the entire process of awakening. And, and saying that he's sensitive to it in, in this context is telling Ananda, all those things are unimportant. What's important is developing the Dhamma and know that you're developing the Dhamma. That is Saraputta saying, I, was, I have now become sensitive to developing the Dhamma and understanding what I should hold on to and what I should let go of. I was sensitive of the arising and passing away of all phenomena. Remember Kandana when he first heard the Dhamma. All conditioned things that arise are subject to cessation. Saraputta is saying the same thing. I understand the impermanence of all things. I'm sensitive to it. That's an awakened mind. And if you, if you truly understand the impermanent nature of all things, you'll cease hanging on to anything. Lao Tzu said that. Once you understand the impermanence of all things, you'll let go of everything. Buddha said that continually throughout his teaching career. Just as a wood fire's flames arise and pass away, I was sensitive of uh, unbinding from wrong views. Sensitive meaning I knew, I know it's occurred. That's the end of the sutta. Mm -hmm. Pretty good sutta, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's a, it's a remarkable sutta in so many ways, isn't it? Because it gets right to the heart of the matter of almost anyone that begins to take up a Dhamma practice and comes up against that, that fear of annihilation. What's going to happen to me? It's such a common, I think I've heard that from just about everyone that's ever come here and stayed with it. Some people don't stay long enough to even formulate the question, 
but it's that it's that underlying question that I think that drives people from from continuing. We talked a little bit about this earlier too. We just cannot imagine letting go of all these views because these are the views I've used to establish myself. What's going to become of me? And it's really just a fear of the unknown because this is all we know. Um, the other important thing to take from this, this sutta is the reference to those questions that are to be recognized as simple distractions. So notice Saraputta didn't describe to Ananda, I, un I know what happens in this world and the next world. He very well may. The Buddha did. Next week, next Tuesday, there's going to be a talk on the Simsapa Sutta, the mm -hmm. handful of leaves, where the Buddha uses the, the, the metaphor of holding a handful of leaves. And or the what is more, what more represents my knowledge? All the leaves in the tree or the leaves that I'm holding in my hand? Of course, they say all the leaves in the trees, but the Buddha says, well, why don't I, I don't teach all that. I don't teach everything that I know because it doesn't lead to the goal. I only teach what is in the palm of my hand. I only teach the Dhamma. Saraputta is saying the same thing. It's not that there's, there's no answers to those questions. The answers are a distraction, chasing after those answers. Let go of, the, let, let go of that search. Let go of the search for God, meaning understanding where I came from and where I'm going. Let go of those great existential questions and deal with the matter at hand your own ignorance of the way things really are. Because then, from a common peaceful mind, you will find that those questions are irrelevant because I don't need to establish myself anywhere else except right here. And then as life unfolds, you're at peace with it. Which is, Can I just ask a question? Sure. Um... I, I don't... I, I can't seem to differentiate. Uh, well, I understand what the Buddha's meaning as far as the Dharma is concerned to ask those questions is irrelevant to the Dharma. You're missing the point when you're looking outside, you know, away from looking to things uh, and, and not sort of giving up your own views, which is more of the Dharma. But having said that, we do so much of that in life because we have to learn. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And when you when you are learning a topic or a subject, or you you just need to, the world is just changing, and you need to keep up. And you need to learn. Mm -hmm. It's hard to differentiate and take yourself out of learning, wanting to learn a subject when you are wanting to learn a subject because you think. You need to know a subject in the world and yet not get yourself caught not get yourself caught up in the learning yeah oh I, I i i have trouble with that i don't know where the one boundary stops and the next one starts it would it's a, another important and fundamental question isn't it um there from an awakened point of view there is no boundary there's nothing, I don't even like to use these words, but there's nothing wrong or even um, contradictory to the Dhamma to learn things, learn about the world, learn about the universe. But when that learning is taken from the point of view of right view, there's no stress involved and there's no, there's no introduction of wrong views into what you're learning. So while you were thinking, you're thinking about some great teachers like Einstein, Einstein said that the only worthwhile religion, even though he used the word, but he was, he was referring to the teachings of the Buddha, the only worthwhile religion is Buddhism. So he, he actually, he must have understood it, but it didn't stop him from pondering great questions and answering those questions. But I, and even if you, if you look at, I mean, you know, these are probably caricatures that we have of Einstein, but you look at some... When you look at it, he, this was a, a, a completely self-effacing genius, wasn't it? Uh, another one just died the other day. That I think was a remarkable man. I didn't believe in Completely self-effacing, wasn't he? But yet, 
he pondered the great questions. There's nothing wrong with pondering the great questions or even looking to learn something about them, the, the nature of the world we live in. There's nothing wrong with being a quantum physicist. But you would be a much more effective quantum physicist, I think, if you were rightly self-awakened at the same time. And you can do both of those. Or you can learn calligraphy and still be awakened. You could learn, you can learn how to play canasta. Again, I'm just using mundane things now. There's nothing wrong with anything that we might do in the world, but we'll be much more present with what we're doing if we have first developed the Dhamma. Because then what we're learning doesn't have to be any different. Again, we won't bring our views into that. We'll learn something clearly, free of wrong views. Yeah. And no, and that's true about no matter anything we do. There's We live in a world that is rich with experience. We minimize that experience by trying to make it fit into wrong views. That's right. Yes. And so from an awakened point of view, Every single moment of life is meaningful. Why? Because I'm present for it. That's it. That's what Saraputta is saying. He's not referencing anything anything other than I am now free of ignorance. When, when you get, when you have a, a moment or a, a few minutes of being in right view, you realize that it's just taking yourself out of the picture. Yeah. I mean, you can <laughs> just look at something and not all, you know, not immediately put yourself, oh, I like that, I don't like that, I wish that wasn't there, uh, um, now I have to go out there and do that and I don't want it's just like you can just look at it and just be okay with it. Yeah. <laughs> you can be okay with it and you can say, well, I'm going to have to, I mean, just stupid things that you do every minute of the day. Yeah. You can just say, well, I'm going to have to separate those iris pretty soon because they're getting crowded. But it doesn't, it, it doesn't shoot an arrow in the chest. Yes, yeah. It, it's just a slightly tilted view. From it, from wrong view to right from view. From wrong view to right view. Yeah. And it's so much more pleasant. <laughs> I mean, you know, I realize that that's just, you know, that's, it just happened a couple of times and it's just you know then then you go back to that other self or that other way of you know you yeah. just have to keep working at it yeah or or even more important is when somebody says something to you your husband says something that just you know and you just put yourself right in it and immediately you're just like and it's hard i think it's harder to that's when you have to just, you know, do your deep breath. And, yeah. But it, it, it happens. So the arrow hits, but then there's sometimes when it doesn't. Now, you know, you can. Isn't that remarkable? Yeah. It, the 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 more personal situations are, the more difficult it is. But yeah. but but you're, you're describing even understanding it there. The when we let go of self-reference. There's just a self-referencing what's occurring at peace. No, nothing needs to be any different. It's not like you lose your ability to perceive everything. No, no you, you don't. There's a, that say on that's why I like that sutta because it's just, it's like, right. It's, it yeah. seems like an absurd question that I'm asking. Like, if I continue to meditate and increase my concentration, am I going to be, am I going to like disappear? Not be able to yeah. perceive things. Well, of course not. It's ridiculous. But that's what your anatta yeah. Those are questions that they it asks. Uh -huh. Yeah, because from the point of view of <laughs> wrong view, right. that way of thinking can't imagine any other view. Right. And again, so there, you want to talk about a narrow way of living your life, maintain your wrong views, because all you can experience, no matter what occurs, 
a beautiful sunset might occur, but you'll see it in a way that judges it in some way. Like uh -huh. you wanted, you wanted it to be long. Well, it was only three minutes. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I had that experience. I won't, I won't, no, maybe I, yeah, I, won't, I won't tell the story. I tell it often of my getting into the story. Yeah. Um, I've had plenty of those experiences where something happened. We all do. We, something happened that was wonderful and we diminish it by wanting more of it rather than just be present with what, has, what is occurring. But that type of experience can happen in each moment of our life. Each moment of our life can be meaningful simply because it's what's occurring in our life. We think that if we, the implication before we understand it, that we're going to become lumps on a log, an old, an old expression. <laughs> but the opposite is true. We, we, the only way, the way to have the most vibrant, meaningful life is to let go of life and to be, to be any, the need for life to be any different than it is. It just makes sense. Again, a, a human being first awakened 2,600 years ago and lived the most vibrant. When you hear the stories about the Buddha, how deeply involved he was in his life as his life occurred and the lives of everyone else around him. What a meaningful life he had both for himself and for others because he let go of all self-referential views. But there was a self there going on, wasn't there? Mm -hmm. well, that's, I mean, that's the key. That's the answer to, the whole, to that whole problem. But people can't understand it. It's one of the reasons why there's been so many adaptations and accommodations made to even an awakened human being's teacher because teachings, because we need it to be more. And if, when you look at all the adaptations, accommodations, and embellishments that have been made to the, this simple Dhamma, it's all for that reason, to continue eye-making rather than to recognize and abandon eye-making. That's just human nature. It's not, that's not right or wrong either. It's just what occurs. What a remarkable uh, simple sutta. And, uh, any other? I think we've gone around the room, right? <laughs> I, I like how Sarah Puta answers Ananda's question. Rather than saying your questions are what's confusing you, because yeah. that is that rec that sh demonstrates sort of the middle way of, of teaching and meeting and under where he is and and like because that's what I was thinking when I when I was first hearing it was like oh this the questions are the questions are you have to let go of the questions like oh the questions and but sometimes that's not. Right. possible yeah and also not i mean answering that question was also skillful yeah the it, way that sarah Puja answered it and said well i was perceiving well, i don't remember the words but basically the way i understood it was well, i was perceiving what was occurring yep i was sensitive that, to what's occurring right yep. in, in that moment so it wasn't like I was, and so if whatever was occurring is what I was sensitive to. Yeah. Notice too that Ananda wasn't asking what happens in the, to me in this world or the next world. He was talking about what happens when I let go of those views about it. So it wasn't a direct mm -hmm. question. Right. When Vachagoda asked the Buddha, it was, I want you to tell me. What happens to me? Happen. Okay. And so the, yeah. the, in that, and again, it's so important to understand the situation. In that situation, uh -huh. the appropriate answer was that question is what's confusing you. And then he taught appropriate, right. uh, an appropriate view. So, and also yeah. Ananda has, Saraputta understood that Ananda has a, a basic understanding. Right. Right. Um, Saraputta was known very quickly as one of the, one of the great teachers of the Dhamma because he had the ability like the Buddha did to understand the question and the appropriate way to answer it, as opposed to say uh, Mahakasapa, who was another great monk, but who often who only taught situationally. In fact, he only taught when the Buddha asked him directly to teach something, because he knew that Kasapa had certain skills that mm -hmm. would result in that. Mm -hmm. Really, I mean, mm -hmm. great sutta, but a great class too. Yeah, great class. Has um, everybody? I think you did the the. You're using the app. Um, I put it down on my uh, smartphone, but not my iPad. 
because may I find it? you haven't tried to or you, you i have tried to i've done exactly the thing on my ipad with a little square with the arrow yeah the arrow scroll along the three dots select um add to home screen add, add to home screen that's it it lit up that's it right press the yeah you button. should have an icon on your home screen yeah it's not yeah. Hmm. Hmm. how about you i don't know I haven't tried. I haven't I tried. It on my iPhone, but not my iPad. But I can just go into the website. But I haven't been able to down. I mean, I don't. I don't even think I would know where to go to download the app. Oh, it, it, what, what browser do you use? Chrome. In the top right hand corner, there's three dots on yeah. top of each other. Click on that, um, and you you'll see somewhere in the in the drop down menu, add to home screen. Click on that. Oh, you might have to then give it yeah. permission to actually put it on the home screen and then you'll have an app. Okay. And the the real benefit of it is that you'll have instant access and it's very quick to the website rather than going into your browser again. So you just right. you mean a shortcut. The app just takes Basically. you Basically. Right. Yeah. It's like miss, miss, it just takes you right to the to the uh, site. website. Okay. Yes. And yeah. And it's through when you access it through the app, it's almost always much quicker too. And the, okay. there's technology behind that. Okay. Okay. Um, you're you're eliminating the some of the interference between a browser and the website. You're again without getting too technical about it. You're you're yeah. It's more of a direct access. So it should, if you if you still have trouble, I let me know because I, I I did it. I put it on my. I don't like use my iPad often still, but I was able to put it on there with no trouble. So something's missing. Can I just say something about last Tuesday's time? Yes. Um, we concentrated on the eight-ball pad. Um, I've always, well, it's hard to explain, but the eight-ball pad is, is like the teachings of the Buddha, like um, Christianity has the um, Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. And, you know, there's always sort of like instructions, if you will. And I've always thought of the eightfold path as the instructions that the Buddha left for us. Mm -hmm. After the Tuesday's class, I see it more as the instructions for me, <laughs> rather than for the big understanding of Buddhism, we don't like that word. Um, to go along with the big understanding of, you know, what the Buddha taught. Yep. Yeah, I don't see it that way now. I see it more as a personal instruction. But I've always known it is. I've always known that's what it's there for. It's there for for a guidance guidance for me. I've always known that, but I see it more as a personal instruction from the Buddha. Mm um for me uh, just, no, I, just as, as that just mm -hmm. for me yeah thank you for saying that so you're what you're what i yes it's a, it's to be experienced personally mm -hmm. this is not these aren't commandments yeah. the difference between obvious the obvious difference between the ten commandments and the eightfold path is that the eightfold path is a path to free yourself of the need for the things that the Ten Commandments is warning us against. So the Ten Commandments are don't do this, don't do that, mm -hmm. don't do this. Mm -hmm. But there's no underlying instruction on how not to do that. <laughs> right. The Buddha recognized, you be careful, that I'm going to say it the way I say it. The Buddha recognized the futility of saying just be good mm -hmm. because he understood the underlying cause of bad. It was wrong thinking. So there's nothing to say, I don't remember that. You better not covet the Lord's name in vain. Is that one of them? I think it is. I think it's the first one. Take, 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 take. Yeah. Unless you understand why you're doing that. Or to, you know, like, don't go right. around coveting other people's wives. Well, that's good instruction, isn't it? But if you're caught up in that type of behavior, how are you going to change it? Somebody saying, no, 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 isn't going to do it for most people. Thankfully, there's an app because oh, I want to get into that. <laughs> so again, it's not it's it it's not instructions on. It's not it's not describing how you must act in the world. 
It's describing why you don't act the way you want to act in the world. And then it gives you a path to change that. And it's a personal experience. It has to be personal experience, doesn't it? Doesn't it make yes, sense? It does, yeah. How could it be anything else? I know from the day I was born, people told me I had to do something. Man, I'm gonna. If they, it, it's lucky somebody didn't come along and tell me you better, you better breathe because <laughs> I'll hold my breath till I die, <laughs> just to prove how right I am. And, and I can think of, you know, we can all think of those kind of things that we, because we want to keep establishing yourself, even no matter how good the or how rational the teaching might be or the suggestion, don't accept it because we take it personally. What, again, this, this is a personal experience of awakening, and it can only be that way, as Sarah Puta described here. Pardon me? I see it more that way now. Yeah. But it, it, it's taken a little while to develop that, mm -hmm. that clear view. Mm -hmm. that, again, that's the point. It's the, it's, it's the difficulty in the Dhamma, but, it's, but that's, why we, that's why right effort is part of the Eightfold Path, too. It's a reminder that we have to continue our persevering effort. If not, we're going to fall back in wrong views that justify saying, now oh, this is a lot of hogwash. Or it might just be, I, it's just too hard for me. I can't do it. I can't meditate for an hour, whatever it might be. It works. It's a very gentle path that anybody, any human being that is sincere about awakening can become rightly self-awakened. What a great class. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll finish as we always do uh, with Meta. So again, find your relaxed meditation posture. Gently close your eyes and gently close your mouth. <clears throat> and again, take a moment to become mindful of your in-breath and your out-breath. And these are the Buddha's words on metta from the Karaniya Metta Sutta. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires is not born again into this world. Thank you all for a wonderful class this morning. Peace. Yes.